Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Tawana, director of the Rock Ethics Institute, and delighted to be welcoming you here today to our first lecture this semester in the area of bioethics. Um, we'll have other lectures throughout the year, so keep an eye on our webpage and uh, see what we're doing in this important area of research. Today I'm delighted to introduce to you our newest faculty member in the area of bioethics and medical humanities. We're very delighted to be welcoming Jonathan Marks to Penn State University as an associate professor of bioethics, humanities, and law. Uh, Jonathan has the unusual distinction of linking multiple campuses. Part of his line runs through the College of Medicine and links the College of Medicine to our Science Technology Society department, which is the home of our new bioethics and medical humanities minor. And it will be a department soon, so might as well say it, right? <laughs> Yeah, Martin's the director, and he's working on that happening. Um, Jonathan is working very hard to strengthen interdisciplinary and collaborative relationships in this area, in particular working on a uh, master's degree that would link the law school, um, the bioethics program here at University Park, and the bioethics program at the College of Medicine. So keep an eye out for good and exciting things happening um, thanks to him. He received his various degrees from Oxford University and is qualified both as a barrister and an accredited, accredited mediator. With more than a decade of experience in legal practice and has litigated in, and advised on issues of health law, environmental law, pharmaceutical regulation, and human rights from both an international and a European perspective. Just so you get a sense of some of what he's done, he's worked in particular on the Pinochet case, as well as representing Dr. Nancy Oliveri in her landmark case, seeking to quash the equivalent of European equivalent of a new FDA new drug approval. 
which very fortunately for us led to his appointment as a Greenwald Fellow in bioethics and his increasing commitment to bioethics in medical humanities and our great good fortune in hiring him here at Penn State. He has a variety of research interests and it's interesting to think about what he's currently doing. He is looking at the role of healthcare personnel in interrogation on the war in terror and the legal and ethical implications of their, in their participation, as well as the legal and ethical implications of the use of neuroimaging and other technologies in, in interrogation practices in the war on terror and tomorrow he'll be part of a Guantanamo teach-in that tomorrow Thursday Thursday I've got to change on my calendar Thursday he'll be part of a Guantanamo teach-in that's a, a nationwide teach-in on issues in on Guantanamo and you'll be talking about medical bioethical issues and that if you want to get more information about that, you can uh, look at the Rock Ethics page. I think we've connected with it, and it will be um, beamed into the Beam Building, 327, right? He's also working on the implications of the latest empirical work in behavioral psychology for public health and public policy. Um, especially counterterrorism and catastrophe planning and the tension between human rights and the protection of public health in the aftermath of a bioterrorism attack or, an, an, or a national catastrophe, as well as conflicts of interest and other ethical challenges in the research, development, manufacture, and promotion of pharmaceutical compounds. So please. Come on in. Um, so as you can see, we're, we're very, very fortunate here at Penn State to be welcoming um, Dr. Marks. And I'm delighted as a director because Jonathan is our newest faculty associate at the Rock Ethics Institute. And we are um, looking forward to great things happening in the Rock thanks to him. So please join me in giving him a, a hearty welcome to Penn State. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Nancy. The, the wonderful thing about being introduced by Nancy is that you always feel like a much more interesting person afterwards. Um, today I'd like to tell you about the future of bioethics, or perhaps, to be more honest, to give you my vision of the future of bioethics. And one of the first questions that some of you may have uh, is, what is bioethics? A great question. And in fact, I ask that question to myself often when I'm flicking through the New Yorker. Because there are always cartoons that seem to me raise interesting bioethical issues. Um, I, I'm not going to project them all on the screen because that would cause great expense to be incurred. But just to give me an idea of some of the things in the New Yorker in recent weeks, a picture of two congressmen walking down the steps of the Capitol, and one says to the other, of course, it would be a different story entirely if we could extract crude oil from stem cells. It gives you a sense of the thinking. T two others I'll share with you briefly are a physician in a waiting room with his patient, and he hands a prescription to the patient, and the quotation is, try these, I just bought 100 shares. Um, one, uh, one other one I'll share with you is a couple chatting at a party over a glass of wine, and one says to the other, I couldn't afford health insurance, so I became a Christian scientist. Now, those, those cartoons, in my view, raise some of the fundamental issues, issues in bioethics. But what is bioethics? Well, the phrase was coined in 1971 by the biologist Van Rensselaer Potter, um, who was in particular concerned about developments in the life sciences and the way that would impact human nature and our relationship with the ecology of the planet. Uh, but the definition which many people seem to use is the one by, uh, uh, is the one by Warren Reich, who was the editor of the second uh, edition of the Encyclopedia of Bioethics. And his definition was, um, bioethics is the systematic study of the moral, dimension, uh, moral dimensions, including moral vision, decisions, conduct, and policies of the life sciences and healthcare, employing a variety of methodologies and in a interdisciplinary setting. Um, does that seem like a good workable definition to you? Well, it's certainly a starting point. Um, those of us who work in bioethics and have done so for a long time think that 
there might be one or two elements missing from that definition. Um, and one that I'll flag with you just now are two questions. What about public health policy more generally? And what about population health issues? Issues affecting um, not just individuals, but large population bodies. Now, in truth, there is, of course, a broad spectrum of definitions of bioethics. Uh, at the very narrowest, the two core elements are medical ethics and research ethics, about which I'll say more in a moment. And at its broadest, uh, many people consider bioethics to encompass just about anything that raises fundamental questions about life and justice, uh, and in particular, the relationship between the two. But let's look at the, the narrower definition and the two core elements of that narrower definition. Um, many of you, I imagine, will have heard of the name of Hippocrates, the mathematician and physician who is now often described as the father of medicine, um, responsible for what we now know as the Hippocratic Oath, which is taken in a variety of forms by medical students and physicians throughout the world. Um, and of course, the core element of the Hippocratic Oath was the Latin maxim, primum non nocere, which means, or nocere, which means first, do no harm. Now, that may seem surprising to you today. You may take it as a given that your physician should avoid harming you. Um, but if we recall that in the time of Hippocrates, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, medicine couldn't actually do that much. And so that first mandate of doing no harm actually made a great deal of sense. Gradually, of course, um, physicians have developed uh, powers to heal rather than simply to, to care. And as a result, medical ethics has also had to evolve. Um, this occurred especially, has occurred especially since the 1960s, as medical ethics has been reinvigorated by new technological developments. And I list some of these here, there, kidney dialysis, organ transplantation, medically safe abortion, et cetera, et cetera. And just to give you an example of one of these, so when kidney dialysis first became available, but there were very few dialysis machines around, one of the tough medical ethics questions was, who do we put in dialysis? And in 1962, a, a committee of physicians uh, who also employed the assistance of a lawyer, a priest, and a, a quote, homemaker, um, started to ask these questions. And it was a very controversial committee because one of the factors that they took into account was what they called good citizenship. Um, and that meant that if you were a single man who had a criminal record, you weren't going to get dialysis. And if you were a married man and you had two cute little children, you probably were. Um, so not surprisingly, their decisions were often controversial and they were uncharitably dubbed the Seattle God Squad by the, by the media. Um, the other core element of uh, bioethics uh, is research ethics. Now, while medical ethics deals principally with the relationship between physician, patient, um, and family members. Research ethics deals generally with the relationship between um, clinician and researcher in the conduct of clinical trials. Now, this body of bioethics is driven, I might, I have described there as principally a reactive enterprise. Much of ethics and law, much of the scholarship in ethics and law, and I'm guilty of this as much as anyone else, is that we react. Something egregious happens, and we get upset, and then we decide to do something about it. And that indeed is how research ethics has developed over uh, the last 50 years. Initially driven by Nazi experimentation on Jews and others, horrendous experimentations in which um, uh, prisoners were subjected to uh, all sorts of horrendous experiences, including high altitude experiences, including um, f extremes of cold in order to see how long a human being could survive, uh, submerged, for example, in cold water, or um, intentionally having wounds inflicted on them to observe how the wounds did or did not heal. That, of course, led to the Nuremberg Code, which you um, may or may not have heard of, which of which the principle, or the core uh, mandate is that the voluntary consent of the human subject in uh, research is absolutely essential. Um, and gradually, those norms were broadened and expanded in the World Medical Association's Declaration of Helsinki, which originated in 1964 and has been revised a number of times since. I should point out that the abuses that occurred were not simply abuses at the hands of uh, the Nazis during World War II. Alas, there were a number of scandals in the United States. Perhaps the most famous of them all is what is 
known as the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, quote unquote. Um, there are a number of things that are appalling about that study, but in essence, what was happening was that um, African American farm workers were turning up to a syphilis clinic where they were receiving incredibly painful procedures, principally a lumbar puncture. I hope none of you have had to endure a lumbar puncture, but it's one of the most incredibly painful procedures involving the insertion of a needle into the spine. That, was, that procedure was simply to monitor the spread of syphilis. They were not being treated, although they thought they were. And this continued up to 1972, even though by that time, penicillin, which would have cured them or treated them, had been available for 30 years. Um, this, in turn, resulted in the, the Belmont Report in 1979, which lays the foundations of um, research ethics in the US. And we see from these types of abuses the emergence of autonomy and informed consent, and consent as being core in not just research ethics, but also in medical ethics. Now, when you look at some of these questions, uh, the ones we all tend to focus on in medical and research ethics, there are some bigger questions, I think, which lie underneath them, some latent questions, which go beyond the, what's sometimes referred to as the dyadic relationship between physician and patient or clinician and research subject. Now, just to give you a sense of some of those, uh, for example, in uh, medical ethics, one of the real issues of concern is an issue sometimes described as the dual loyalty of physicians. What is the right and proper thing for a physician to do when he or she is employed, for example, in the military and has obligations to the military as well as um, his oath as a physician? Or when a physician is employed by an HMO and has to make decisions regarding the allocation of resources, including the denial of treatment to a patient. Those are just some of the questions which reveal a much bigger issue, namely, what are the social purposes of medicine? What is it legitimate for medicine to do? And therefore, what can we legitimately ask physicians to do, which doesn't necessarily put the health of patients or those with whom they come into contact first? The other limb, uh, research ethics, again, uh, has a number of underlying uh, and rather important issues in my view. For example, uh, a very uh, timely topic is the funding of clinical research in the United States and the ethical issues that arise as a result of that funding. Um, the case that Nancy referred to very briefly, um, the Olivieri case in which I must confess I was involved, uh, I represented a Canadian physician who entered into a dispute with a drug company because she was working on the clinical trials of a drug. She thought that it was toxic and possibly ineffective. She wanted to tell the patients in the clinical trial and change the consent forms. The drug company threatened her um, with a breach of, uh, they threatened legal action if she told the patients. Uh, they uh, pulled her from the trial. They manipulated the data. Um, uh, that's certainly her case, and the case I think um, she's demonstrated persuasively. And then they got the equivalent of a, a new drug approval uh, in Europe. And what was interesting about that case is that both her hospital, which was Toronto Sick Kids, and the University of Toronto, which was her academic institution, initially did not stand by her. And some would say that it was no coincidence that the drug company with whom she had the dispute was at that time negotiating a donation of $20 million plus to her institutions. So those are some of the difficult questions of academic independence and conflicts of interest that tend to arise in the current practice of, of clinical trials. Um, of course, there are, in addition, a number of hot topics that you heard about in the media today, most conspicuously Terry Schiavo, but there are many others. Um, uh, one which recurs, of course, is um, the propriety or otherwise of stem cell research, the implications of mapping the human genome for privacy, um, what happens when all our genetic information can be put in a compact disk, what will the implications of that be for us? Another hot topic is physician-assisted suicide. Is this something physicians should be doing? Should the law permit it? Um, enhancements, perhaps less of a conspicuous issue within the broader community, but in the bioethics community, a very important issue, um, the subject of a President's Council on Bioethics report, Beyond Therapy. 
um, which asks important questions about what are the limits of therapy and when do you stop um, treating someone and when are you actually enhancing their abilities. Um, for example, by improving their memory or by improving their physical performance. And then finally, in my sort of ad hoc list of hot topics, bioterrorism and catastrophe preparedness, which is something uh, that I'll be talking about in a seminar later on today and that many of you read about time and time again in the press about how prepared or not we are for um, a terror attack or pandemic avian flu and what the ethical implications of such um, an event would be. But what I want to talk about today briefly, and this is my overarching theme, is how there's so much important work to be done, not so much in what are often perceived as discrete issues of microbioethics, but the bigger picture questions, what I call, and others too, sometimes call macrobioethics. And just let me give you an example. So when we talk about genetic privacy, and the mapping of the, the human genome and the implications that that will have for us once all our personal genetic information can be put in a CD, one of the main concerns you read about in the literature is that this will result in discrimination or in the denial of health insurance because one or other of us, or most of us, are identified as having some kind of gene or genetic susceptibility to a particular condition. Now, of course, this assumes all sorts of questions about uh, you know, genetic determinism and the, and the reliability and predictability of, of these genetic vulnerabilities. But leaving that aside, I think it's important to note that our concern about genetic privacy is driven in large part by the fact that we in the United States don't live in a country that has universal access to health care. If you had universal access to health care, genetic privacy wouldn't disappear as an issue, but one of the core concerns um, of those who care about genetic privacy would be greatly reduced. Let me give you another example. Physician-assisted suicide. Those who oppose physician-assisted suicide often say, well, one reason why we shouldn't legalize physician-assisted suicide is because we don't want to encourage people to take their own lives out of a sense of guilt, or we don't want to allow families to pressure their terminally ill relatives in order to take their own lives. Well. It's very difficult to have a discussion about physician-assisted suicide, again, when we live in an environment in which we don't have universal access to health care, because the cost of end-of-life care, and it's the costliest of care, um, is, if anything, going to create the pressure on those um, to opt for physician-assisted suicide. So again, physician-assisted suicide becomes a more manageable issue in a country in which you have universal access to health care. Um, the third one I, I've identified there again is enhancements, and slightly different uh, critique of enhancements. But one of the main concerns in the literature about enhancements is that we'll have this twin track society. There will be the enhanced, those with the superb memories, those with the great mental abilities, those who will live to 150 or 200, those who will be faster on their feet, and then there'll be the unenhanced. That the likes of you and me currently. Um, now, those concerns are not immaterial, but we live in such a society already, as I'll demonstrate to you in a few moments, where we at, there are those of us who have health insurance, those of us who don't. Concerns about um, uh, two classes in society should be triggered by our existing reality, not by concerns so much about a future one. Um, and the fourth area, is, bioethic, is bioterrorism and catastrophe preparedness. And again, if you read the literature on bioterrorism and catastrophe preparedness, what you see is, time and again, that a real concern about our ability to react to another Hurricane Katrina, to pandemic avian flu, to a bioterror attack involving Ebola or some other virus, um, is that again, in a nation where you don't have universal access to health care and you have fragmentation of health care, you don't have the infrastructure in place in order to best deal with these kinds of catastrophes. Again, something I'll talk about in my seminar later today. Um, so those are some of the, the big questions. Let me just say briefly a little about, rather, the, the disciplines and methodologies in bioethics before I talk about how I think we need to address some of the bigger questions and why. So much of the literature in bioethics 
is authored by physicians, lawyers, philosophers, health economists. Health economists don't necessarily consider their enterprise and, uh, an enterprise in bioethics, but I hope by the end of this talk you'll see that I have good reason to consider it um, part of the ethical enterprise. And each of these disciplines tends to use its own methodologies. Others, of course, do contribute. I list a few here, epidemiologists, sociology, anthropology, um, theology, etc. Um, and of course, we also learn a great deal about um, those traditional dyadic relationships between physician and patient by reading literature. And there are a number of people in this campus who teach courses in medical humanities in order to help us understand some of those more difficult issues through literature. Let me say something briefly about the methodologies um, before asking the question whether, before I'll ask the question, which is, are these disciplines and these methodologies adequate to ask some of the, ask and answer some of the big questions in bioethics? Now, the, for those of you who are philosophy majors or those of you who are philosophers, um, you will know better than I that uh, three of the major philosophical perspectives fall into, the, sorry, the majority of philosophical perspectives fall into one of these three categories, um, uh, consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics. And just let me say a brief little bit about them. Consequential, consequentialism, as you know, um, looks at the consequences of an event in order to assess whether or not that event is something which we consider to be one we approve of or not. So let me give you an example. Um, utilitarianism, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. There are other variations, the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, many of us find consequentialism uh, troubling. So for example, we wouldn't want hospitals to adopt a consequentialist approach to the treatment of patients. Because consequentialism might tell you that if you have a terminally ill patient, now he's going to die in the next few weeks, but you have five people who desperately need organs now. A consequentialist perspective would say, well, um, greatest good for the greatest number. Let's kill the, uh, kill the sick um, man who's terminally ill and save the five others. So for many of us, consequentialism doesn't capture all that's morally or ethically salient. Um, deontology, another approach, looks instead at the worth and at the worth of us as individuals, it looks at questions of the fundamental rights of individuals, and so uh, an ethic of duty would be somewhat troubled by the consequentialist approach I've just described. And then thirdly, there's uh, in the literature, there's uh, what's called virtue ethics. Uh, essentially the idea that um, if we combine a uh, if we combine certain virtuous characteristics with a, a seasoned practical reasoning, that is how we arrive at the best judgments in the face of ethical or moral dilemmas. Now, that's a very superficial um, positive history of three main strands of philosophy, um, and I'm not a philosopher, so I urge you to read up more, but just to give you a sense of the framework for the ways in which some of the ethical issues, particularly uh, dilemmas of physicians on the ground are addressed. I should say that for my money, I don't find any of these um, exhaustive. I think each helps identify factors that are morally or ethically salient, but I don't think I, any of the three can tell the whole story. In the body of literature, you not only see these three um, uh, philosophical perspectives, but you also have a number of methodologies. One is, uh, which is particularly popular, is known as principalism. Um, which essentially sets to address ethical dilemmas by using four principles. Non-maleficence, which is, if you recall, Hippocrates, primum non nocere, you know, do no harm. Beneficence, do good. Autonomy, and justice. Now, um, those concepts are each um, as broad or as narrow as the beholder chooses, so they're not unproblematic. But in addition, Resolving tensions between those principles is not unproblematic. So a hunger striker at Guantanamo Bay would say, well, if you respect my autonomy, you won't force feed me. The Department of Defense says we're doing good, beneficence, we're saving their lives. How do you resolve the tension between those two principles? Um, other approaches to bioethical uh, questions involve casuistry, which is basically uh, very often, uh, philosophers write of this in the literature as though it's something new, but it's something that the Anglo-American system of common law has been doing for years. 
you reason by analogy from cases and over time principles emerge from individual cases. Um, and then we have John Rawls to thank for reflect reflective equilibrium, which for my money is, makes the most intuitive sense. Reflective equilibrium tells us that we have our principles and we have our daily experience and there's a conversation between the two. We use our experience to modify our principles and we use the principles to help us resolve the problems that the experience presents us. So it's a continual balancing process. Um, other approaches you'll find in the ethical literature are narrative ethics that emphasizes the importance of narrative rather than moral theory for identifying what is and is not ethically salient. Feminist bioethics is a, is a very fruitful branch of bioethics that I encourage you to look at if you haven't already, in which challenges a lot of the um, a lot of the traditional literature in bioethics. And to give one example, um, the ethic of care derived from Carol Gilligan's work, which asks us to think not so much about male justice-based concepts, but um, more feminine ethics of care concepts. One looks not purely at questions of obligation, but at the relationships between patient and care and the emotions that they give, to which they give rise. So that is basically um, a 14-week course in the principles of biomedical ethics in five minutes. So you'll have to forgive me for uh, the rather sweeping statement. But I describe the field in that way, simply to say, well, how do those disciplines help you answer some of the big questions? Well, let me give you the big questions. Here are some global health statistics. Every year, at least 10 million children die from readily preventable causes, according to the World Bank. Of these, 2 million die from diarrhea and respiratory tract infections alone. Um, those of you who attended the Paul Clark lecture last year will know about the short, last year, last week rather, will know about the shortfall in healthcare professionals throughout the globe. But there's one little uh, slant on the statistics I'd like to give you, which you may not have appreciated last week. There is a global shortfall of 4.3 million doctors, nurses, and other health professionals. But it, the brunt of it, the vast brunt of it is felt in the African nations, who have 24% of the global disease burden, only 3% of the professionals, and only 1% of the expenditure of healthcare in the world at their disposal. Um, every time I look at this picture, I'm amazed that the man standing up is smiling. That is Dr. John Awanur Williams. He is the only doctor at Nkwanta District Hospital in Ghana, he serves a population of 187,000 patients in the northern part of the Volta region in Ghana. And every so often when I'm having a bad day, I think, well, you know, it's nothing compared to John Awanu Williams. And he's not an unusual example. He is just perhaps one of the most extreme examples. And just pause for a moment to contemplate how we would ever keep a global pandemic under control in nations in which one physician has a patient cohort of 187,000 people. But the statistics which cause us concern are not limited to uh, the developing nations. In my view, we have a great deal to be concerned about in the United States. Um, we have the largest healthcare expenditure in the globe um, it's approaching two trillion dollars. In spite of which fact, 46 mil million people have no health insurance. And as a result, according to the Institute of Medicine, 18,000 people die under the age of 65 every year because they do not have health insurance. Now, just to give you an idea of how, how this happens, if you're in a car accident, you have a 37% higher chance of dying, according to the Institute of Medicine, if you don't have health insurance. And if you're a woman who's unfortunate enough to get breast cancer, your mortality rate is 30 to 50% higher. In addition to these colossal human costs, the Institute of Medicine estimates that the lost revenue and other benefits to the United States from having these people uninsured is more than $130 billion a year. And just in case those of us who have health insurance were beginning to feel comfortable in our own position, um, we have no reason to be. In 2001, approximately 2 million Americans experienced medical bankruptcy. That's filers for bankruptcy and their dependents. And what is incredibly important, 
is that of those whose illness led to bankruptcy, more than 75% already had health insurance at the time they became ill. All right, so that's just one quick tour of some of the fundamental problems in public health in the world and in the United States. That alone will be the subject of a whole course or a whole series of lectures. So again, <coughs> forgive me for the whistle stop tour. But I'm doing this because I simply want to flag some of the fundamental questions and ask how can bioethics answer these questions and how can it answer those questions better than it has done now? And there are three sub approaches or sub questions I want to tackle here. The first is the scope of bioethics. Well, it should come as no surprise from what I've said that I think we need to focus more on health policy and on questions of population health. Every half an hour that Congress debated over whether or not the feeding tube should be pulled out of Terry Schiavo's stomach, another American died for lack of health care. I think we need to recognize the macrobioethical dimensions of public health finance. That means that public health finance isn't simply an issue for health economists. It's not simply a budgetary issue or an allocation issue. It's an issue, an issue which has a core ethical dimension. And more importantly, we need to explore the relationship between the macrobioethics questions and microbioethics on the, on the ground. To give you one example, I'll be talking about again later on today. Many of you may have heard about the physician and two nurses who were accused of murder in New Orleans. It is alleged they took the lives of a number of patients after the flood, when the temperature was 110 degrees in that building, and they had actually been told no one is coming. So you, in my view, you have to consider those microbioethics questions in the larger context, and to acknowledge that in the face of an emergency, and a catastrophe, if we're not prepared, we're going to put physicians in positions where they will have to make incredibly difficult ethical choices. Um, in terms of bioethics and population health, some of the big questions, these fall into a number of different categories. Um, some of these categories you'll see discussed in a recent piece by Norm Daniels in the Hastings Center report. But essentially, health inequalities between different groups, especially um, social and racial groups. The Institute of Medicine, again, has produced a, a report on health disparities um, uh, between African Americans, Hispanics, and others. And despite um, efforts uh, to suppress some of the more worrying statistics, they are out there and are available. Um, and one has to look at the implications of uh, public health infrastructure for those individual communities and whether or not certain communities are better served than others. And of course, it's questions not simply of um, economic access, but also of geographic access. Again, the second topic, international health inequalities. We have to consider what our obligations are to the developing world. We conduct a significant proportion of our clinical trials now in developing countries. Why? Two reasons. One, it's cheaper. Secondly, they are uncompromised. You know what that means? Uncompromised means they don't have aspirin like we do. They don't have all sorts of other drugs they take on a daily basis that we do. So it's actually to, advance, to the advantage of um, clinical researchers to use this population whose blood is, unlike ours, not polluted by other pharmaceutical compounds. And the questions we have to ask, amongst others, is are we perpetuating inequalities in these developing countries by conducting research there? And or what do we owe the communities in these countries um, uh, to which we expose to this testing? And there are also questions of intergenerational equity, um, by which I mean not just equity between generations living now, but also questions of us and future generations. Um, another tranche, in addition to um, public health policy, um, in addition to population health, is the relationship between public health and the environment. Everybody knows that Socrates, sorry, Socrates. <laughs> Everybody knows that Hippocrates was the father of medicine. Um, but few people know that he actually was one of the first to identify the link between public health and the environment. And on airs, waters, and places, he said, if you want to investigate medicine properly, you have to, amongst other things, um, look at the seasons of the year, the winds hot and cold. When you come to the city as a stranger, you should consider its situation. Um, you should consider the water the inhabitants use, whether they're marshy and soft or hard, whether they're saltish and unfit for cooking. You should consider um, whether the ground is deficient in water or well watered, amongst other things. And you should consider the mode in which the inhabitants live. 
and this could have been written today, it seems to me, uh, that what are their pursuits? Are they fond of drinking and eating to excess and given to indolence? Or are they fond of exercise and labor? Questions which, uh, uh, to which bioethics are paying some, beginning to pay some attention today. Um, this is a, very briefly, just a chart which shows the relationship, not surprisingly, between health and well-being and a number of factors from lifestyle through to the built environment which we are just now, the natural environment and the, and the global ecosystem. Um, but I just want to also focus on questions of our immediate built environment, questions for, of um, access for those who are disabled, questions of space and light, noise, humidity, exposure, radon gas, you name it. These are all factors in our built environment which have influences on our health. And it is my hope in the next uh, year or two to teach a course on this campus with a number of other faculty from a variety of different departments on the relationship between bioethics and the environment. And I don't just want to talk about um, the big questions. And some would say there is, and I share this belief, there are very few questions bigger and more important than climate change and its effect on the environment and public health. But also to focus down to a local level at questions such as urban planning development and redevelopment. Um, when you build a power plant, for example, or a hazardous manufacturing plant, which communities do the environmental risk bearing? Well, I can answer the question as a matter of practice. Who normally does the environmental risk bearing? It's the poor and racial minorities, as a rule. Um, transportation infrastructure. We often talk about the health hazards of road, of road, rail, and travel infrastructure for those who live nearby. What we spend less time talking about are the health implications of a lack of transportation infrastructure um, for communities who can't get around because they don't have public transport. Um, also questions of ethics and architecture and design, in my view, the, these equally fall within bioethics. Um, such questions as replacing slum dwellings with more durable solar-powered structures with their own waste disposal systems. Indeed, as one political commentator has, has pointed out, that's the way to solve half of Iraq's problems, because without centralized waste disposal and electricity, um, you take away a possible target for terrorists. Um, uh, but that's one that's a recommendation that isn't being followed as of yet. Food and nutrition. Many of you may have read the piece recently about food deserts in the Chicago suburbs where essentially you, didn't, you don't have access to basic health provisions. All you have are fast food joints. And in fact, um, my wife reminded me when I showed her this uh, draft of this presentation that when she was um, trying to get people, trying to register voters in Trenton a few years ago, she was told there wasn't a supermarket in the city of Trenton, New Jersey. And when my wife Lisa asked why, the reply was, if you owned a supermarket or chain of supermarkets, would you build one here? Um, so these are, these are real issues. Um, and we have to explore, I think, the ethics of subsidizing the production and supply of healthy foodstuffs um, and also providing nutritional education too. Other issues are occupational health, both um, those of us who have sedentary occupations, but also those of us in industry and rural farming. Um, and also important issues in relation both to urban health and rural health. And just to give you an example, in urban health, in cities with high crime rates, children don't, children don't go out to play as much, they have higher incidences of obesity and therefore greater levels of diabetes and morbidity. Um, and then rural environment, um, particularly important in Pennsylvania, where you have runoff and other industrial pollutants. Um, uh, and by industry, I'm also referring to industrial farming. Uh, they can also have a serious impact on public health. And again, the, I, I touch, I've touched on already questions of public health infrastructure and catastrophe prevention and management. But those are just some of the issues that uh, I'd want to consider on such a course. And those are some of the issues which I think bioethics needs to consider within its remit and to address more fully. Okay, bioethical actors or agents. Well, my question here is, does bioethics need personality? By which I mean, should speakers, not by which I mean, should speakers be more interesting than me, by which I mean, should we have some concept similar to that which we have in the law? And of course, what I mean by that is that we have such a thing as a legal personality. Corporations have legal personality. It's a way of um, protecting commercial actors and limiting their liability, their legal liability. But legal personality is also the foundation of their obligations. Companies are 
liable to, uh, are committed to their contracts that they make, and um, they're liable to pay damages if they break their contracts. They're liable in tort if they're negligent. Um, legal personality means not just privileges, but also responsibilities. Now, um, what might bioethical personality be? Well, it would be responsibility, coterminous or coextensive with the sphere of your action and or impact. And that would mean that we spend more time considering not just the ethics of individual physicians and healthcare professionals, but we consider the ethical responsibilities of HMOs, pharmaceutical companies, the food industry, and of course, the likes of you and me. Um, when we talk about corporations, however, one of the important questions is, well, how do you reconcile the legal duty that companies have to maximize profits for their shareholders with ethical duties? Um, and uh, it may seem like an entirely fanciful enterprise to draft a charter of corporate social responsibility in which you put responsibility to, your cons to consumers and employees and community first, and then to shareholders last. Does that seem pretty unrealistic to you? Does it? Well, um, in 1943, Robert Wood Johnson didn't seem to think that it was an unrealistic, um, an unrealistic possibility, and he drafted the the credo of Johnson and Johnson, which says, uh, and I'm not going to read it all to you because it's rather long, but just to give you a sense, it says, first, we believe our responsibility is to the doctors, nurses, and patients, to mothers and fathers, and others who use our products and services. The next re declared responsibility is we are responsible to our employees throughout the world. Compensation must be fair and adequate, working conditions clean, there must be competent management, and their actions must be just and ethical. Third declaration of responsibility is we are responsible to the communities in which we live and work and to the world community as well. Um, and that includes a responsibility for protecting the environment and natural resources. And then our final responsibility is to our stockholders. Now, Robert Wood Johnson, I think, recognized that the way to be a, a success in the corporate world was actually to do all these other things too. Um, but words, of course, alone are not enough. Um, and let me give you some examples of words that aren't backed necessarily by sufficient action. Kraft's um, promotional statement is, our vision is about meeting consumers' needs and making food an easier, healthier, and more enjoyable part of life. Note the healthier. PepsiCo, our health and wellness initiatives strengthen our commitment to contribute to the well-being of our consumers. Coca-Cola, this one I love most of all. The company exists to benefit and refresh everyone it touches. <laughs> And then um, McDonald's cares about the well-being issues that are so important to many of our customers. Um, and that's taken from a City University report by Lang and others. Um, it's disturbing enough to note that the advertising budget of PepsiCo and Coca-Cola combined is greater than the World Health Organization's biennial, that is, two-year budget. So it gives you a sense of... Um, how little the World Health Organization has to do to meet its incredible mandate. Um, and just to, to follow up on that, in their report, Lang and others, uh, it's a report, by the way, not published, but reviewed by um, Marion Nestle in The Lancet, whose work on the obesity I commend to you. Um, she basically said that um, some companies are reviewing their product ranges in light of the new health agenda of the World Health Organization but the majority are not. The reformulation of products without endangering market share is a real difficulty, but should not be an excuse for inaction. Companies do not just respond to public taste, they help shape it through marketing and product formulation. In failing fully to respond to the new health challenges, companies appear to be distancing themselves from their responsibility for unhealthy consumer choices. Um, a more difficult question, which I don't have time to explore here, is what are our individual ethical responsibilities? But again, that's something else we should consider in bioethics too. Okay, so who should do this big bioethics and how? Well, let's deal first with how to do bi macrobioethics well. First of all, I think it requires an understanding of public policy. And that means not just understanding public policy, but understanding how to communicate in a language that other policy actors can understand. Um, there is an intersection between philosophy and public policy regarding questions of health priorities and aggregation of health benefits. And just give, let me give you one example. The um, fourth millennium development goal calls for the reduction, a two-thirds reduction in infant mortality for children under five by 2015. 
at the moment, um, the 60 worst uh, countries for infant mortality are not going to make that uh, agenda. And one question about which philosophers have reasoned um, uh, very uh, coherently and persuasively is do we improve the plight of those who are worst off first? Or do we maximize our impact in the short term at least by helping first those who are a little better off? Now, while the philosophical literature in this is comprehensive and, and actually some of the best literature on the question, it's not always written in a language which policymakers are going to understand. So the question is, how do you bridge the gap between the philosophy and the policy? Um, I think it's also important to recognize when doing, dealing with these big questions that the Western philosophical tradition is not the only way to address these issues. Anthropologists and theologians can provide other perspectives that are helpful. And let me give you just one example. When we conduct clinical trials in the developing world, if you read the bioethical literature, what it tells you is that there are basically two approaches in terms of repaying the countries whose populations we use for clinical trials. Either you can make the drug that you test on them reasonably available, which isn't, of course, always going to be possible because sometimes the trials reveal a fundamental problem with the drug, so it's never going to be marketed. Alternatively, you provide fair benefits. Now, what I want to suggest here is that that language is, in the debate is somewhat parsimonious and actually not necessarily um, one which is universal outside um, West, the Western philosophical tradition, where we view some things as duty and other things as supererogatory, that is, above and beyond duty. And I just wanted to give you an example, um, this example because in Islamic and Talmudic perspectives, um, justice and charity are not distinct. Charity is a necessary component of justice. And in fact, in Hebrew, interestingly, the word for charity, the word for justice, and the word for a righteous person are all basically variations of the same three syllables. So perhaps when we deal with some of these fundamental questions, we need to think about other traditions um, apart from or to supplement the Western philosophical tradition. And then who should do bioethics? Well, I apologize for um, uh, doing such a terrible thing to Lord Kitchener, who tried to get my fellow countrymen to sign up in the Second World War, um, and uh, rather to encourage them to, 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 to go to war in the First World War, not the Second World War. Um, and when I should put this on the slide show and showed it to my wife, she said, well, nobody's going to know who Lord Kitchener is because these are Americans. So I'm happy to tell you that Uncle Sam um, was stolen from our poster, so we got there first. Um, and maybe there's a lesson there. Maybe in America, the solution to some of our healthcare problems is looking not necessarily specifically at Britain, but at what Europe does in terms of healthcare. And just let me finish with one final statistic, because I don't just want to say bioethics needs you. I want to leave you with this little nugget. So for example, France spends, in America, we spend um, close to a fifth of our gross domestic product on healthcare. And we rank, according to WHO tables, somewhere in the 40 region, 37 to 40. Um, France spends, in terms of percentage of its gross domestic product, half that, and it comes right at the top. So maybe here we need to think about other ways of doing things. Thank you very much. So if when you ask your question, just put your hand up, I'll bring this to you. So I answered all your questions. Oh. Thanks very much for a really wonderfully evocative talk. Um, I guess my question addresses the last point that you made, and I know it's a macro question, um, but I'm wondering about um, the position or how do we talk about what might what others might call the overuse of medicine and technology in this country. Hmm. Um, I know it costs a lot. We have a lot of technology. It's available to people who can afford it and people who have health insurance. Um, but in other countries, they have different methods of allocating those uh, very expensive technologies and even things such as antibiotics. So I'm wondering 
what you think the debate or the conversation around overuse might be. Okay, I think overuse is a great question. Um, thank you very much. And I, I, I do have, I, I want to formulate it in a, in a different way. I think it is true that often uh, people in, in the US and actually in other developing countries too have great expectations about what pharmaceutical products can do for them. Now, what few people know is that there are only two countries in the world where direct consumer advertising of prescription drugs is permitted, the United States and New Zealand, where there's a conversation about abolishing the practice. Now, I think it's no coincidence that um, we have had in the last six years, especially, a real emergence of direct consumer advertising of prescription drugs. At the same time as we're having a discussion about whether um, we run through our physicians too often to ask for drugs. If you look at the studies, what you find out is that patients who see ads for drugs on television tend to go and ask their physicians. You also see that, I mean, the studies vary in terms of what impact this has, but you also see that um, in many cases, this leads physicians to prescribe the drug even where they themselves have qualms about using the drug on this particular patient and would not have done so absent the specific request. So I'm often concerned about the way in which that issue is framed as though individuals are, we as individuals as, as consumers of healthcare are solely to blame, when in reality I think part of the problem is manufactured by um, direct consumer advertising prescription drugs. So again, and I think that's a macro question. So what I would say is um, we have to think a little bit more carefully about overhyping the effect of drugs and creating unreasonable expectations in consumers. I mean, it's, it's not surprising that we want drugs. These adverts tell us that even though we're arthritic, we can dance the tango if we take Celebrex. I mean, that's literally what the ad says. Um, there were advertisements, just to give you a sense of, of the, the, the other senior, uh, more unpleasant side of this, advertisements placed in uh, Gay and Lesbian magazine uh, suggested that antiretroviral drugs really were much more effective than they are. They showed pictures of people climbing mountains and throwing the javelin. Study revealed that a number of STD clinics in San Francisco that this was leading to unsafe sexual practices amongst the readers of the magazines. So what I would say is you're right, overuse of drugs is an issue, but I think there's a systemic and macro question which um, can help explain that. So that I'd want to address that as, as part of answering that question. Thank you. Thanks for a, for a great talk also. Um, following up on that, I, um, I wonder if you could address this issue, the issue of the relationship between public and private and the provision of health care, uh, especially when looking at the, the disparities in health expenditures between a place like the United States and other places like France, as you mentioned, and then explanations of that, which might be, for example, uh, differences in administrative costs in private health insurance as opposed to public single-payer uh, schemes, and whether it's overly simplistic to think that a major source of this skewing of the distribution of, of uh, health services, in addition to what you were just talking about, sort of pathologies of consumption, as we could say, um, has a good deal to do with the overemphasis on private delivery in um, some places like the United States, or is that a simplification? Um, my sense is that the public-private distinction is important, and and it is important for the reason you identified in your question, which is administrative costs. Um, when you have a system administered by the state or by some form of government, whether it be federal or state or local, the administration costs tend to be in the single-figure region. So you tend to have sort of two percent, you know, usually in the region of about two percent or so. In the U.S. Um, the private sector incurs administrative costs, and I've seen all sorts of quotations and figures for this, but you're talking about gross multiples of 2%, anything from you know, 15 to 30%, depending who you read. So it's certainly true to say that the administrative costs are um, much greater um, when you have private health care. And certainly what I should say is they're, they're much greater here as a result of private health care. And we know that because you know, Medicare also has, you know, very low um, admission costs as compared to the private sector. So I think that is a, I think that is a substantial part of the problem. I, I think there are also other, other, un, other hidden costs, by the way, which we don't see. I mean, if, you add, if I added up the number of hours that I and my wife have spent 
you know, chasing bills, which seem to go, when they're faxed by the physician, seem to go straight to a shredder at the other end um, of the HMO. I mean, seriously, if you add up all that time, I mean, the, those figures generally aren't included in the, the assessment of the cost. So I think, I think that's a, a fundamental problem. And I also think that it play, the fragmentation of healthcare amongst the private sector plays into fundamental problems of responsiveness when it comes to um, you know, a, 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 some form of crisis, whether it be an avian flu pandemic or a bioterror attack. So I think that's important. Thank you. To have offered such a detailed and clear map of a vast and varied territory in, in such a short time is truly impressive. So I feel somewhat bad about asking my question, <laughs> but being a philosopher, I will ask it anyways. Um, there, there was one thing somewhat conspicuous by its absence in terms of your account, and that was education. And so, and I know you have things to say about that, so, uh, and in the economy, you just left it off. So it would be interesting to hear how both in formal and informal ways, questions of education intersect with those of bioethics. Um, it's a great question. I think education did appear, but only in the context of when I was talking about food. I talked about you know infrastructure and also education. So, but I agree. I, I didn't give it great emphasis. Um, I think I think education is important, but you know I, I tend to. I mean, I I wrote a piece recently in which I said, should we actually educate the seek to educate the public in order to combat? the messages from the private sector, which are often not the most productive. So for example, should we have, after an advertisement for the latest expensive drug, which is patented, um, should we have a government-funded advertisement, which says, you should also go and see your doctor and ask if this generic drug, blah, 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 which cost five pence for, f five cents rather, for a, you know, for a pill, is a more suitable alternative. Um, it's and oh, and by the way, its side effect profile is well known because it's been on the market for 30 years. Whereas really, we can't say what the side effect of that flash drug um, for which you just watched the last advert. And in fact, what's interesting is, is Pen the state of Pennsylvania has considered educating its physicians to be an important endeavor. And the state of Pennsylvania, as I understand it, has hired sales reps to promote generic drugs to physicians, recognizing that there's a role in the education of its physicians. Well, I think there's also possibly a role for the education of the general public in, in the way that I've, that I've just described. So I think, I mean, I think that's just one example. So I think education is important. Um, I think people, I think people in the US tend to react badly to the government trying to get educate people. So I think it's, I think we need all these brilliant students in, you know, in health communication at Penn State to graduate, get out there and tell, um, and tell us how we can do it better. Because I think the message isn't always um, communicated in the best way. But I agree with you. I think education is important. I, um, I just have a question. The, um, Jonathan? No, sorry. The, um, what was interesting, I thought, about the pandemic is that in our own interest, doing something would make sense. Say, healthcare in Africa, healthcare in, in South America, and these other developing nations in Southeast Asia. Yet we can't do that. We, we just don't do it. And even though it's in our own interest, and we clearly, I mean, it's clear that this is something that will affect us we still just can't move on it. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. Um, that's a great question. And one I've actually written about in, I've tried to address, but not comprehensively. And I think there are a number of factors that, that play into this. Some of them, I think, when Nancy mentioned that I've been doing some work in behavioral psychology, I think some of those, some of the work of recent um, behavioral psychologists have been truly fascinating, looking at the way in which we respond. Um, I mean, just to give you a, an example, in a, in a study, um, people were asked how much they would pay for flight insurance to cover terrorism risk. And a separate group were asked how much they would pay for flight insurance to cover all risks. All risks, by the way, includes terrorism. And the terrorism group said they'd pay more, even though they're getting less insurance than the other group. And they paid more because terrorism emotionally appeals to us. Instinctively, you know, we feel frightened, and that's the risk we want to, you know, we want to respond to. What we also know is that when we respond emotionally in that way to those um, what are sometimes called dread risks, like terrorism, we tend to respond symbolically. Right? In other words, we tend to 
So, for example, I, I, I'm going to make the case later on that, for, that stocking Tamiflu is a sort of response, symbolic response to pandemic avian flu. We have no idea whether Tamiflu will work. It might, it might not. But it certainly gives us a lot of reassurance stocking the stuff. Or it gives some people reassurance stocking the stuff. So there's some psychological factors at work. There are also, I think, um, political factors at work and constitutional factors at work. You know, this is a country which has a constitution which, um, as a, I ended up in a debate with somebody in a bed and breakfast in Asheville um, about guns and healthcare, amongst other things. And he, his closing line to me was, well, it says in the constitution I have a right to carry a gun, but it doesn't say anything about the right to healthcare. And that's why, you know, I care about one and not about the other, in so many words. Um, you know, now that, that's obviously not everyone's perspective. But I think um, amongst sort of international uh, human rights treaties, there's the covenant of civil and political rights on the one hand, and then economic, social, and cultural rights on the other. And in America, we um, have historically felt more willing to embrace civil and political rights and reject economic, social, and cultural rights, which include, for example, the right to health care as something, you know, as something other. Um, or something, dare I say it, you know, socialist or communist. Interestingly, of course, China's approach is to ratify the covenants and economic, social, and cultural rights and say, you know, not interested in civil and political rights. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, the reason why I mention that is simply because I think it's just one of those other factors. So I think um, part of it is uh, behavioral psychology, part of it is culture, part of it is political, part of it is historical and constitutional. And all these factors, I think, play into as not answering the problem in the right way, even though, as you say, it looks like it's in our own best interest. And the more of us who try and point that out, I'm, you know, I'm hoping will help, but I'm not optimistic. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks for the talk. Uh, so uh, I found the contrast of cases of France and the United States compelling. Uh, and I also was struck by the uh, further addition of the example of the African continent. And if you look at those, that sort of tripartite of cases, um, in the France and the US case, it seems as though there might be things done uh, by looking at France in particular as an object lesson that would help us revision the American healthcare system. On the other hand, uh, the case of Africa led me to believe that really this is functionally, in a vulgar Marxist sense, a base superstructure problem. And you ha until we do something to really rethink the uh, search of global capital and where that goes and where it's consolidated and where it doesn't exist uh, at all in any significant portion, we're not going to be able to address conditions like Africa. So I don't want to be a pessimist, but I'm wondering, w within the largely the industrialized West and perhaps Northeast Asia, um, fine, but what about some of these other, uh, maybe even described as subaltern uh, environments and, and regions? And how would we be able to address those issues without substantively rethinking distribution of capital on a global scale? Um, well, I think you're right. It's, a, it's going to be a much more difficult problem. I think there has been some willingness in the West to at least look at addressing the problem, but I think that willingness hasn't been matched by you know, the requisite funds. The last G8 summit um, the, in the summer, there was unanimous agreement that, money was, that more money was required for you know, global health needs, but they couldn't agree on where to get it from. But what I would say is, so, so that's just emphasize how difficult the problem is. And, and the Millennium Development Goals you know, are we're not on target at all. But what I would say is that uh, what we can do in the West is certainly not make things worse. And we can do other things to ensure that we don't make things worse. As Paul Clark made clear in his talk last week, one of the problems is that you know, in the, when we have a shortage of nursing or other healthcare staff, we tend to pull them from the developing nations. Now, you know, it's one thing to pull one physician from a community of 100 physicians, but imagine pulling John Awanua Williams from that community in, you know, in Ghana, and then you have a population of 187,000 people with no physicians. So I think um, you're right, that problem is a difficult one positively to solve, but we should at least be making sure that we aren't doing any more harm. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, we've seen several cases recently where, where governments have taken the action to uh, protect the public from sort of capitalist influences, be it uh, warning labels on uh, packs of cigarettes or more recently in Massachusetts, uh, the removal of, uh, of soft drinks from, from schools. Uh, what do you think is the, the role of government and, and um, 
the, the, the moral, um, what, what can the government do in that respect? Uh, great question, and I probably have a different view on the role of governments from many Americans because I grew up in a different country where we, and part of our views of local government are, constant, you know, dependent on our constitutional foundations and our political ideology and other things. I sometimes think here that um, the fear of so-called big government is. Um, maybe this is uncharitable, but a little paranoid, in the sense that you know we we do depend fundamentally on government to provide us things. You know we depend on government to provide the roads, um, which incidentally they don't always necessarily do to the best of uh, our ability, but their ability. But that may have a, a taxation element uh, to it. But I think that I think that where the government has the. I mean, my vision is that if you think of my ethical framework, it's a government has the power positively to impact the public health of its population without fundamentally undermining a, a core freedom or right, then you know, I, I think it should do so. Um, and I don't think living without paying taxes is a core freedom or right. Uh, uh, I think, you know, as citizens in the global community, as citizens in our local communities, we benefit from those communities and we should pay for them. And that when we do, we empower our governments because we pay them taxes to do things to improve public health. Um, do I think, I mean, the initiatives that you mentioned, do I think taking, um, do I think manning sodas from schools is a, is a good idea? I have to tell you, I think it's a terrific idea. Um, you know, to give you another, just to give you another sort of example that moves me, there have been three shootings in schools this week. Three. And yet, we still think, you know, the lack of gun control we have is, is justified because we shouldn't interfere with people's, you know, right to bear arms, depending on how you interpret the uh, meaning of the uh, Second Amendment. You know, so, so my view is that, um, my view is that government can do a great deal to protect people and to benefit them, and that I, I need to be persuaded a great deal more than many of your countrymen do, that government should st stay clear of some of these issues. Yeah. Speaking of conspicuous by its absence, as a <laughs> barrister, a lawyer, uh, I was sort of surprised that uh, you didn't discuss the role of the legal community or the litigious society that we live in uh, as part of this overall problem. Uh, for example, when a battery of tests are ordered at a hospital uh, following that great medical dictum of CYA, uh, unless uh, something go wrong and we didn't test for it. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Oh, and by the way, wasn't Kitchener the uh, hero of Khartoum? He was, yes. Um, <laughs> Um, Asquith said, not a great man, but a great poster. <laughs> um, first of all, I should say about litigation that I can rest comfortably under the mantle of being a barrister and not an American litigator. Because while it's true that litigation in the US has led to some extent to the defense of practice of medicine and that's increased costs, um, that's a it very much a phenomenon in the US, but I should add that still, I think, um, the escalating health costs are due to a number of other factors that I've highlighted in my talk. I don't think that's, you know, I don't think the legal system is, is the be all and the end all. But let me throw a positive spin on, on what my countrymen do elsewhere in the world. There was a great little study in The Lancet yesterday, um, in the last month or two rather, which showed how legal action in a number of countries in the world has given meaning to the right to health. Often, the right to health in those nations is not, doesn't simply exist as a result of a commitment um, to uh, the, the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Sometimes, in fact, most often, it was accompanied by a provision in that state's constitution on the right to health. Countries like South Africa, for example. Um, Venezuela, I think, is another. But what happened was lawyers were able to do wonderful things, in my view, like make antiretroviral drugs more available to um, AIDS patients by challenging government policies, invoking the right to health, arguing that those policies made the drugs more difficult to get. So I would say that as far as lawyers doing bad is concerned, it's more of a problem here than elsewhere. And there are many more examples of lawyers using litigation to do good, I think, and to achieve um, healthy outcomes. Um, comment and a question. Comment simply that despite the, the great breadth of what you have discussed today, 
the, the overall concept of bioethics might potentially include not only human life, the bio part of it, but whatever the relations between our human endeavor and other forms of life. Question, coming back to where's the boundary between government and legal responsibility, on the one hand, an individual choice, would you make tobacco use illegal? As a particular example, the government has certainly supported tobacco farming and is now, I'm not sure I'm correct, but I think so, still supporting tobacco farming to some extent uh, to create an export crop mm -hmm. at the same time as the government is investing in various levels of government are investing heavily in regulating what one puts on a cigarette package and in educational programs to tell mm. people that this is not a good idea. Does your sense of the role of government and law go as far as saying let's simply make this illegal or yeah. not? Yeah. Um, first question first. Um, I think bioethics does encompass the relationship we have with other creatures. I certainly should say that Peter Singer, who considers himself a bioethicist and is very concerned about um, uh, the use of animals in clinical trials, amongst other things, um, considers that to be well within the field. So yes, there are, there are bioethicists who consider animals important. Um, they consider themselves bioethics and the fate of animals to be within their discipline. Um, the second question about uh, how far should the government go? I'm incredibly troubled by the approach of corporations such as Altria, which used to be Philip Morris, where you know they have these nice user-friendly advertising campaigns in the US saying that if you want to give up, log on to our website, da, 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 da. and then as you say, the sort of recognition that there are other more fertile markets to exploit elsewhere, and if you build support um, at home in the US, that's a good way of carrying on what you're doing um, outside the US. Um, I think my view as to what, whether or not that practice should be legal um, must nonetheless be curtailed by existing um, jurisprudence in the US. I think it um, very unlikely that even if you could persuade Congress to legislate and the Supreme Court as currently constituted would uphold uh, any such piece of legislation. So I think as a practical ma matter, it's not a reality. I do consider the conduct, however, wholly unethical. And in certain other countries, it may be that um, governments would feel able to legislate, but I just don't th simply think, don't think it'll happen here. Again, that was a great talk. Um, you've kind of covered this already, but I'm, I'm curious whether you could talk a little bit more about um, you, you cover the ideas of clinical ethics and research ethics, and to some extent, those have a ready-made ready audience for them because of certain laws, policies, and institutions that require that we develop these forms of ethical yeah. reasoning. So what I'd like you to talk about is how we create an audience for a more macro-level bioethics, because I think these are really important questions, but um, you know, we're producing bioethicists daily who are trained to look at a more narrow focus. And so how do we create institutions that educate bioethicists to think at a macro level? And how, we, how do we create an audience for that kind of thinking at the level that there is for clinical and research bioethics? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. I can't give you the, I can't give you the answer because I don't think there's a single answer. But let me tell you what some people are doing that I think helps. So for example, there are, you know, there are a number of people who recognize that it's not enough to speak to the bioethics world alone. So a good colleague of mine, a friend, Jonathan Moreno, who um, runs the Center for Biomedical Ethics um, at the University of Virginia and is just about to move to the University of Pennsylvania, also has an affiliation with the Center for American Progress. They have developed a progressive bioethics initiative. They hold seminars and programs in DC, and I have gone to them, and the people who come are people from all, all walks of life. They're not just people from the bioethics world, they're people from um, the press, they're people from the policy world, they're people, um, one person I met, you know, her day-to-day -day job is dealing with um, pregnant women who are having their children taken away from them because of, you know, history of drug abuse. You know, so, and people, you know, and somebody with that job thought it was important enough to take a day out of their afternoon to come to a workshop about progressive bioethics. So I think more of a conversation between the policy community and 
the bioethics academic community will definitely help. Now, unfortunately, there's now a kind of culture war going on in that policy community because you have um, the progressive bioethics agenda and the Women's Bioethics Project and others um, who are really advocating the, something similar to the kind of vision that I'm talking about here. Um, and then on the other side, you have, and I've often, I always have difficulty understanding why this is the other side. After all, whatever our politics, we all live in the same environment. We all get sick. We all have, you know, there's so much in common we share. I find it difficult to understand why this perspective is considered a, you know, a left wing or a liberal or a progressive perspective. But nonetheless, there's a real, um, there's real competition going on for attention between those groups and the right who are promoting the same familiar issues of stem cell, abortion, physician assisted suicide, et cetera, et cetera. So, my con so I think the conversation between the policy community and the academic community is part of solving the problem, but my niggling concern about it is the way in which the debate might get involved. But on the other hand, just flicking through the New Yorker cartoons, which I did before giving this talk, you'll see that, you know, one in every 10 cartoons seems to be on a bioethical issue. And the big questions, you know, pharmaceutical research, you know. So I think, you know, I think it's happening. It's, it's going to take time. And anything you can help me do to spread the message, I'd be glad to have your help. Well, please join me today in thanking Professor Marks for a very exciting conversation. <laughs>